Welcome to the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Chalmers, a shoulder and elbow surgeon at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Brian Waterman, a uh, sports and shoulder surgeon at Wake Forest University in uh, North Carolina. Brian, how are you? Great to join you, Peter. Before we get started, I should mention the views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon Society, the University of Utah, Wake Forest University, or the institutions of any of our guests. Um, so today we have an episode on a topic that we as surgeons are still struggling to understand, which is the etiology of glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Now we all see this problem frequently in our clinic, and patients frequently ask, Doc, why did I get arthritis? Why me? Why is this happening to me? And I personally feel that we still have a long way to go in answering this question. Um, so to discuss, I invited two people who are really interested in this question and who are international experts. So first from Washington University in St. Louis, we have Dr. Ben Wisniewski. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And then next from Paris, France, we have uh, Dr. J.D. Werthel. J.D., welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Hello. So I wanted to start with um, the biochemistry side and the genetics side. And there's obviously been a lot of work to understand kind of the molecular bi- biology of osteoarthritis. It's really too much for our discuss here. But I wanted to ask both of you, do either of you know of anything that's close to clinical impact in terms of kind of diagnostic or prevention in this area? So, Ben, is there anything where you think we're kind of on the forefront? I mean, people talk about, there are things that people are talking about now. Is there anything that you think that we're close on? I think that there's uh, very limited data um, or even uh, progress in this area that allows us to make significant impacts for our patients in prevention of osteoarthritis or even identifying those who are going to develop it down the road. Um, So while there is a lot of research going into this area, there's not a lot that's specific to the shoulder. Um, or definitely anything that I'm able to counsel with my patients on. I think the big questions that we get from patients in this area is stem cell injections, um, and that's something that I have to sort of walk them through about the promise in the future, but nothing that is currently available. So you're not currently using stem cells in your practice with osteoporosis. What about you, JD? Anything that you're using biochemically right now with arthritis and its prevention or prevention of progression? Nothing to add to what Ben said. I think we don't know enough today. Uh, I mean, there's no data that I'm aware of, of uh, that allows us to counsel the patients or to have any clinical implication. Um, uh, do, do you have any information? Because you, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I hear occasionally people talk about doxycycline. I hear people talk about IL, you know, ILR1 inhibitors. I don't know that any of those things really have clinical data right now. What do you think, Spri- think Brian? Have you had anything you that you know of? Probably the one place where people talk about the most is if you have an injury and you know that patient has a high propensity for subsequent arthritis, that's maybe a spot where you could intervene theoretically. Yeah, probably the best model to extrapolate from is the post-traumatic osteoarthritis model. And uh, a lot of that is from blunt force injury as a former military physician. Certainly that's been an area of focus. We've looked at synovial and serum markers as a means of potentially predicting secondary arthritis. Probably the bigger question we need to ask is, does that extrapolate to the glenohumeral joint? And I'm not so certain. Probably the best model we have and and would be the best to to help to record this would be to look at uh, serum levels after initial shoulder dislocation and try try to follow the natural history of development. Um, And those are often done with the Samuels and Prieto classification for osteoarthropathy. Obviously, the challenge there is if you design that study in your head, then it's going to take you 30 years to complete it. So the advice I always got was don't design studies that you'll retire before you can get done. Here's my question next. Let's move on from biochemistry and talk about occupational hazards, because this, I think, is one that we do know some stuff about. So, Ben, when a patient comes in and asks, why to get arthritis, do you think that their profession or their occupation plays a role? Yeah, how I counsel patients in this area is that uh, I do think that their occupation plays a role, and, and people that um, are laborers or use their shoulder more active have been associated to have increased rates of, of glenohumeral arthritis, um, and especially competitive um, athletes or patients that play combative sports, um, males and people that lift overhead have been associated with eccentric uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis, and genetics, of course, plays a role in that as well. I think that that's sort of, well, that's true, and the patients ask questions and try to relate it to their job or to sports that they've played in the past, it doesn't really change where we are now oftentimes. And that conversation is more, for me, is just about educating them about because they're curious why they got here, but not that I would change anything about them because I think that those activities are healthy for them both physically and mentally, and I'm just trying to restore them back to, to, to be able to do those activities. Do you agree with that, JD? 
we have we have this uh, data from uh, Philippe Moroder's team now pretty clearly, and it's true that uh, contact sports overhead athletes. Uh, uh, he looked also at uh, uh, people involved in uh, fighting activities, co combat sports, and these are at risk. Um, but uh, like Ben, I think these patients, you can counsel as them as much as you want. Uh, usually when you see them, it's already too late. And uh, regardless, they will not stop what, what they want to do and what they like to do. So I don't think there's much uh, influence in what we're going to tell them there. Are you ever counseling Ben patients Let's say you see someone who's young who does have early arthritis. Are you ever counseling them? We should talk about finding another profession. How does that go over? How do you have that conversation? I think that that is certainly a conversation that I have in the patients that, who say present with the B0 glenoid who don't haven't yet developed significant arthritis. And maybe there's a potential to intervene to prevent its progression to requiring an arthroplasty and talk to them about how their their lifestyle or their jobs may uh, in, um, progress that. But I don't make firm recommendations against it because I think this is very important to defining people how they are, um, just m making sure that they're aware of the risks and potential modifications that can be made. Let's talk about osseous morphology because this is, you know, we're orthopedic surgeons. This, I think, is where, for a lot of us, our primary interest really lies. So, you know, there's been research on the critical shoulder angle, and I think there's a more global understanding of scapular morphology developing and maybe its contribution to shoulder pathology generally, but gun humor osteoarthritis specifically. JD, a lot of this work has come from Europe. What, it, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? Where, where is the current thinking in Paris on, you know, the contributions of the scapula and its morphology to gland humor osteoarthritis? Well, I think that thanks to uh, Christian Gerber and his work, uh, we have been slightly moving from the uh, valve classification, which was uh, uh, different types of glenoids, the A-glenoid, the B-glenoid, the C-glenoid, etc., to now having uh, valve uh, scapulae. Uh, and I think that we need to think more of the A-scapula, the B-scapula, uh, etc. And uh, uh, I think that uh, all the work that Christian has done on the morphology of, on, of the acromion uh, probably is uh, going to be uh, something very important in the future. Osteotomies of the acromion, we have done uh, one case with him and uh, we have uh, another one that is planned uh, very soon and, and I truly believe that uh, uh, this will be uh, uh, something important for the patients that Ben described who are B0 patients with a uh, uh, where conservative treatment might, might work and prevent uh, shoulder arthroplasty in these guys. So you, it sounds like you've done done one, one planned. When you say planned, how does that how does that work for you for this case? Or does that mean planned like you're planning in three dimensions? Or do you have you? How do you do that case? So uh, planned, I mean scheduled. But sure. uh, so the patient is in is in two weeks. But planned, uh, we we have a so there's a statistical shape model uh, of a healthy scapula. Uh, and uh, um, you compare the three D anatomy of the of the given patient to that statistical shape model, and uh, with the engineers, uh, you can decide where you want to place your osteotomy uh, to reshape the acromion, uh, namely to uh, correct the posterior slope, uh, down sloping of the acromion, and to have it more horizontal. Uh, sorry, the other way around to convert it from horizontal to down sloping to prevent this posterior translation. Uh, and also, uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, proposes to correct the glenoid retroversion, which I don't know if it is necessary or not, because all the past experience we have on only doing uh, uh, modification of glenoid version has not been very successful in the past, but maybe the combination of both is necessary, or maybe just the acromion osteotomy is necessary right now, we don't know. Peter, I'm curious about your approach to this, and I think this is something that I've been following for a while and am interested by the acromial osteotomy. I, I feel that in the United States, that thought is very aggressive for us to do osteotomies of patients who have B0 glenoids. Have you considered doing this in any patients that you've seen who have had B0 glenoids? I, I haven't done any acromial osteotomies myself. I think this work is fascinating, and um, certainly I, I, don't, I don't think that it's something we've arrived at lightly. So while I agree that it seems that uh, you, you think about the thought of cutting the acromion, I mean, it's, as you know, like our first role of shoulder surgery is do no harm to the deltoid. So the acromion is its, its base. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to think about it, but I also don't think that I have a good option for the patient with a P0 glenoid. What do you think, Ben? If, is this, what does it seem to you? Does it seem like overkill? 
I think that a lot of the uh, data that we now have about scapular morphology as well as cuff imbalance and muscular imbalance is pointing to the potential that this is a, uh, playing a role in developing the, um, the, posterior humeral, the uh, static posterior humeral subluxation and, and, there, and then leading to posterior glenoid erosion. I just don't know that we are going to be accurate enough in our osteotomies to correct that and intervene early enough. So I'm, I'm trying to actively research in this area to see if the chromium morphology is the, the true predictor and then if hopefully Europe will tell us whether this is going to be something that we can intervene on. And can, I, maybe, can I ask you a question about this for the one you've done and the one you've planned and obviously the ones you've discussed with Christian. How, how much of a change are you making? Because I think the accuracy here is a big deal. I mean, we certainly you can, on the computer, plan to make very small adjustments, but as we all know in the operating room, I mean, you cut with a saw and you fix with screws and nothing ever looks exactly the way you've planned it. It's true, but we, we use only patient-specific guides, which improves the, the precision. And on the post-op, immediate post-op CT scans, the measurements match uh, the, the plan. So. Um, I think the precision, given the instruments that we now have in 2024, is getting there, and, and I think we, this will not be the issue. The issue will be whether this really works or not. Mm -hmm. And as for what you were saying regarding muscle imbalance, I, I really think uh, that uh, the morphology, the bony anatomy is, is more important than the muscle balance, because I know some studies uh, have shown that uh, there is imbalance between the posterior cuff and the anterior cuff. We have done a, a similar study. And to us, it seems that in the studies that have found uh, an imbalance, it is because they included uh, part of the, of the extra muscular fat around the infraspinatus. And when the head is pushing posteriorly uh, the whole uh, posterior cuff, there is more space between the infraspinatus and the scapula. And this uh, appears to be uh, filled with fat. And if you include that space in the muscle, of course, the muscle is going to be greater. But if you don't, then you find that there is absolutely no imbalance between the posterior and anterior cuff. Yeah, I think that, I mean, that's getting a little bit out of our scapular morphology. But I think that this, you bring up an, an important point. And there's been a lot of studies that have looked at the cuff um, muscle uh, disruption and imbalance. Um, and all the studies that saw differences were based upon cross-sectional areas. And your work and the work um, out of a group that included Dr. Athwal yeah. showed that measuring volume of muscle did not show that, did not see that imbalance. And where you saw an imbalance was more in the deltoid as well as I believe your, your work has yes. shown as well. And that potentially is coming from a chromium morphology. Well, certainly it's, you know, we've, we've studied this and um, I think your work is, is amazing, and the, 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 the truth is that it's a really difficult thing to measure. Um, and the thing that I think is interesting about it is even if it's just a change in the cross-sectional area and not a change in the volume, that change in the cross-sectional area changes the penation angle of the muscle, and that change can result in differences to the fibrosis that may make it less correctable. Um, so that when you go with, for instance, an augmented clinic component to try and correct that patient's version, you, you may, you, the, the, the stresses on that component are different than they would be had the patient never had that retroversion to begin with. And that's, th those things are, I think, very, those would be very hard things for us to measure on imaging studies alone. Definitely. Yeah. Let me ask you about this. I mean, I know this is, we, we're getting a little bit into the muscular imbalance side. Um, and I think that the bigger question this comes to, of course, is this, we've been dancing around, you know, eccentric wear, the B0, which we think over time becomes the B1, the B2, the B3. What do you think are the primary causes of eccentric wear? Is this 100% an osseous morphology problem? What are, the, what are the various things that contribute to this, to, to eccentric wear and glenohumeral osteoarthritis? What are your thoughts, Ben? Well, I think that there's a lot of, I mean, this is a huge area that's unknown, and I think it remains really important for us to determine this because one of the big reasons for anatomic failure um, which we st at least at WashU still consider to be the gold standard total the shoulder arthroplasty is the posterior humeral subluxation that can result in leading to glenoid loosening. And so trying to understand why these patients develop that to begin with can be very important. But the, uh, the things that have been associated at least have been cuff imbalance, which I think that your work, uh, JD, is showing is maybe not as, as uh, true. Um, thickness in the anterior capsule as well that has been associated, but we don't know if that's the chicken or the egg, and could potentially be scapular morphology, or maybe it's all of these things. Um, but there's some good data showing that retroverted glenoid can lead to a, 
to a cuff imbalance, not because there's volume differences, but because the drag of the posterior cuff is now no longer pushing anteriorly, but is dragging the humerus posteriorly. Um, so I think that there could be some early deve developmental factors with glenoid retroversion as well as acromial morphology that overall can be contributing to the development of eccentric wear and posterior humeral subluxation. This concept of drag is interesting. What are your thoughts on that, GD, that maybe there's maybe there's not an imbalance in the muscles, but there's an imbalance of the vectors. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a paper by George Atwal's team, I think, uh, with uh, Sumit Raniga from Australia. Um, there's also, on, on, on the uh, osseous morphology side, there, there's also a paper from uh, uh, Philippe Moroder's team. They looked at the, the position of the vault regarding the, the scapular body. And uh, in these patients with uh, posterior subluxation, it seems the vault is not aligned as much with the scapular body as in the other patients. And so I agree, it's uh, maybe probably a, a, a whole developmental uh, issue that also concerns the vault, but also the torsion of the humerus, which is uh, also altered in these patients. So it's something very global and probably multifactorial. Uh, the, the question is, uh, do all these patients that have similar deformities end up uh, with a, a B2 glenoid in the end, or is it just a subset for some reason that we don't know, we don't really understand what's going on? I think the concept of humoral version as a contributor is one that we're, is still somewhat of a black box. Our, um, you know, I know, talking to Jay Keener, there are select patients where he's talked about humoral version altering osteotomies. Are you guys measuring version when you approach a patient with osteoarthritis in a young patient? Are you considering that? How do you measure that? How do you consider that? So I, if you're asking intraoperatively at the time of an arthroplasty, I am looking at that from an anatomic standpoint and trying to assess via their forearm and their transepicondylar axis, but I'm not making uh, dramatic changes unless I'm really concerned about potential for continued subluxation out the back, in which case I may anavert the humerus a little bit relative to their to where they currently sit. But that's not it's something that I'm, it's not my first move in trying to prevent posterior humeral subluxation. But I think that there's something potentially there for is for an etiology. Yeah, I, I don't measure it because I don't know what to make of it, but uh, I try to place my components as anatomically as possible, so if it's very retroverted, I will, I will try to match that. This probably bridges the continuum between a degenerative cascade and posterior instability, and I think we've talked about some of the static bony morphology, right? The uh, acromion, the scapula, the humerus, but then I also think we need to talk about dynamic movement patterns. How do you think that we can potentially affect change by affecting the order or, or the degree of recruitment of the muscles? Um, so you're alluding to uh, functional posterior instability there. Uh, so it's uh, posterior instability with absolutely no uh, anatomical lesions, at least of the uh, ligamentous uh, structures. And uh, I think this is only a muscle problem, and so we definitely need to address this muscle problem. I don't think that these necessarily uh, lead to uh, osteoarthritis at all. I think it's uh, a different issue. But uh, um, I don't know if there is any study that looked at these patients with functional posterior instability looking at their acromial morphology. I'm not sure this has been done. And this would be interesting to see if if these patients, by uh, uh, altering the, the their uh, muscle control pattern of their uh, periscapular muscles, they can overcome uh, correct morphology of the acromion or not. Um, but uh, the options for these patients have all extensively been discussed. I think what, again, Philippe Moroder proposed with the pacemaker is something very important. The problem is when these patients have failed all the uh, conservative treatments, and I think their Bassem El Hassan has been very helpful for us. Uh, with the scapulopexy and pec minor uh, tenotomy in these patients when nothing else works. Uh, this is a way to uh, uh, re restart uh, their brains uh, by fixing uh, in a transient manner their uh, scapula to the ribcage. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to what, to what JD said, but I think that it's, it really boils down to we're trying to improve their scapular mechanics, um, and that can be done hopefully through therapy, potentially with the pacemaker, to really drive home with the scapular mechanics. But I think it gets to another potential point that we haven't discussed yet for why these patients may develop um, these odd wear patterns and these, uh, these static or dynamic instability. Is there appropriate, there's something wrong with proprioception here that is not keeping them centered, um, and it's, it could be 
potentially be a cycle on itself that they're, they're, they feel unstable posteriorly that leads to abnormal scapular mechanics that then feeds the problem. Um, so I don't know if that posterior instability patient who has poor scapular control then leads to an arthritic shoulder. With, I, don't, I don't know um, how that progresses, but it's certainly something that's an area of interest um, for research. It seems like the challenge we have is that there's so many different factors that come into play. There's this perceived muscle imbalance. In addition to that, there's obviously some osseous deformity. There's probably a population of patients in whom there is an instability problem that could potentially, from the patient's perspective, start traumatically, but that may have been inevitable based upon their morphology. And all those things come into play in determining, you know, I think we have patients that we perceive as surgeons as posterior instability that are probably B0s. Um, I feel like I've seen that patient. Do you, have you seen that in France? Have you seen posterior instability patients where in reality it's they're actually on a degenerative continuum? Oh, completely. I think that's a, a trap. Uh, right. We want to treat them as posterior instabilities, but they're actually posterior subluxation that is going to evolve to osteoarthritis. Well, this is a this is a complicated topic, um, and we could probably talk all day about this one aspect of it. Um, but um, I think, from the listener's perspective, there's still a lot to be learned, and the future I think is very promising. And that there's a lot there's a lot of things happening in this field of shoulder surgery right now. I wanted to ask you about a couple of other things that we that we think could contribute. So one of them that I think is one that we still don't understand is chondral defects. So there are young patients where they have a trauma and then they sustain a cartilage defect in their shoulder. Some of these patients are instability patients. Some of them are not instability patients. So when you see young patients like that, do you think that becomes arthritis? Are you doing anything in particular about those patients? How do you handle that? I don't have any good solution. If it's a, a, a very, very focal defect, I know some have tried uh, to do what is done at the knee. Uh, but I have not seen any series with uh, results. I have never done this personally. It's very little literature, yeah. yeah. So I try to treat them non-operatively as much as I can, and I have no specific recommendations for them. Yeah, I think that that's a very hard uh, thing to know. I have seen a couple of patients who have posterior instability, traumatic posterior instability, who are very young, um, under 18, who have a chondral shear off the posteriorly as well as a capsular labral complex that I think would lead to a degenerative process if let to play. In those patients, I have advanced the labrum up onto the glenoid to try to give them some coverage as well as help prevent um, some posterior instability symptoms. But long term, how that's going to do uh, certainly remains to be seen. What about slap tears? There's an old paper by Peter Habermeyer suggesting that slap tears can be a precursor to osteoarthritis. Do you guys think that's true? Is there a possibility that there's the 30 or 40 year old patient who comes in with the quote unquote slap tear that we could maybe somehow intervene and interrupt the arthritic process or is, do you think those things are disconnected? From my standpoint, I don't, I don't know that paper specifically, but I would imagine that that is just an association with somebody who's developing a degenerative process of arthritis and the slap tear is just a component of that. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Peter, you know, and this may be somewhat of the chicken or the egg, we know that the labrum undergoes a circumferential detachment, and so is that a symptom or a potentially a precursor to the arthritis cascade? I don't know that we know that. I totally agree with that. I, might, I bring it up because I don't think I understand what to do with it, um, but I think it's an interesting phenomenon. The other one I want to discuss is the cuff. So there's traditionally been this thought that glenohumeral arthritis is protective of the rotator cuff. Do you guys both believe that to be true? And if so, why is that true? I believe that to be true pro mostly probably because it's been kicked into my head as dogma um, by all of my trainers. Who, um, but I think that that process has always made sense to me because the data would suggest that patients with arthritis are cuff intact and that the cuff is, requ is required to be compressive against the glenoid, which you need in order to generate arthritis. So our typical patients who do not have superior glenoid wear and have centered or posterior humeral glenoid wear, I would anticipate need an intact cuff to do that. If mm -hmm. they don't have that intact cuff, um, then they are going to um, start to escape superiorly and develop a different wear pattern. So it's not so much that the arthritis is protective of uh, the cuff, it's that the cuff is necessary to, tip, to generate the typical patterns of arthritis that we see and treat. And in all the quantity of uh, patients we treat for rotator cuff tears, we don't see many arthritic patients also, so that would tend to um, 
say that this is true. Uh, again, we, you, what you're describing is kind of the theory of the CSA also, which mm -hmm. uh, uh, would say that these are two different pathologies with two different uh, uh, etiologies, anatomic etiologies. Certainly the CSA is the combination of both the acromial factors that we've discussed, but also glenoid inclination, inclination, which yeah. we haven't really talked about. What, what do you both feel is the role of inclination in the etiology of arthritis? And if it is part of the inclination, are you doing anything? If it is part of the etiology, are you doing anything about it? This is something that we've tried to look at, more specifically trying to look at biplanar glenoid deformity, so not just patients who have a retroversion deformity, but also an inclination deformity. Our ability to look at the pre-morbid glenoid deformity was, was challenging, um, but we tried to do so and, and saw that the um, inclination deformity that was seen was likely potentially not um, acquired, but had pre-existed. Um, and I think that the that inclination didn't necessarily play a role in the development of arthritis, but was more presents a challenge for treating it and getting an arthroplasty that is going to be able to be stable and not have shear forces across it. I think the data is certainly still not fully developed to know if that's true or not. Can I dig in with you just a little bit there? So does that mean when you're, if, if, if I'm a patient who comes to see Ben Smostowski in, in clinic, who's going to have an anatomic arthroplasty, are you correcting the inclination to Zero. I would like it to be to zero just because I feel like that minimizes the shear forces across the implant. I want to get full seating of my anatomic implant with minimal and or even inferiorly inclined placement of that implant. Yes, I, I think you, you said the inclination has uh, uh, probably no role in osteoarthritis. Uh, we don't know that. I agree with you. But it probably has a role in the development of rotator cuff tear. Uh, mm -hmm. Superior tilt, there have been some studies showing that this is a risk for superior for uh, su supraspinatus tear or rotator cuff tear. And I think also this is why for anatomic arthroplasty we should aim for uh, as low as an inclination as possible to prevent uh, rotator cuff tears in these patients also. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting ab about all of that is just that we we've talked for so long about version and inclination has not been as frequently talked about. Um, but I think think it's probably hiding on a lot of our x-rays, um, whether you see it or not. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely true, and we haven't paid a lot of attention to it. Our, the data that we looked at when we looked at our clinical outcomes of those biplanar patients showed that the glenoid implant was put in a little bit more superiorly tilted, um, and that those patients had earlier glenoid loosening, not necessarily clinical failure, but radiographic uh, earlier loosening, and we need more data to know if that is if that's truly because of the superior tilt or because these patients have complex deformities that are difficult to correct. Yeah, there's a Columbia study that shows the same thing, but I think what you say is true that we don't, that's a correlation and we don't know if there may be a second factor that predicts both the failure and the superior inclination. Right. But you have done biomechanical work in your lab, no, looking at glenoid inclination. Yeah, our biomechanical work strongly suggests that superior inclination is very bad for shear stresses on the component, which I think is we probably didn't need the simulator to know that, but the simulator <laughs> certainly confirmed it. <laughs> yeah. What does the future hold? I mean, what when you look forward, you know, both of you um, are young, young rising stars with long careers ahead of you um, and many years in which to ponder and study these topics. Like, what, what would you, what are you, wh where would you like to go with this, JD? Um, that's a good question. I think I think so. To start with uh, conservative treatment, non arthroplasty treatment, uh, have the results of uh, these osteotomies, and and know if it's a treatment that is safe and that we can uh, uh, propose to many patients or not. Uh, then. Uh, uh, for the treatment of osteoarthritis, of course, we still have to think of, of uh, arthroplasty, and I think that uh, uh, something that will uh, uh, change things when we look at Australian uh, registry data is uh, new materials, which are not that new, but uh, cross-linked polyethylene will certainly uh, modify the outcomes, and probably hybrid fixation that has been shown to uh, outperform uh, by far uh, traditional polyethylene cemented implants. Mm. Um, and then the future is uh, definitely, I think, that AI and machine learning uh, will help us solve many of the questions we are trying to discuss today. Certainly, you've shown that in your study with, with cuff muscles, that if we can use better treatment algorithm, better measurement algorithms, sometimes we find different things than we think we will find. What do you think, Ben? 
Yeah, I, I think a lot of the same thing. I think it's a, first of all, we're trying to understand this better so that we can try to help prevent the progression of the disease in our patients. Maybe have some preventative methods outside of the operating room, but also inside the operating room with the, and see how these patients do with osteotomies of the acromion and the glenoid, and if that's potential to help prevent progression. But also with our arthroplasties, so is there things that we can do from an implant placement standpoint? Does the retroversion of the glenoid really play a, a large role? I, I'm starting to believe that it that it does more so than previously. Um, and is that really important for helping to balance this shoulder and prevent um, posterior uh, wear and, uh, and, and lead to early glenoid loosening in these patients? So I think that those are the big areas of research for this topic that I'm interested in and I think hopefully we'll have answers in the, in the short term. I think you guys have offered uh, an incredible amount of introspection on something that's a very heady topic, and so I just commend you on your work to date and really thinking outside of the box and addressing a very difficult problem. Well, thank you so much to both of you for coming on and sharing your, uh, your, your knowledge and your experience, again, on a topic that we're still burgeoning. It's always hard to ask someone about something we don't know a lot about, so I appreciate both of your courage coming on. That's all the time we have for the podcast. Um, thanks too much, all, too much again to both of our guests and for uh, all of our shoulder and out there. Don't forget to subscribe, and we will see you next time. Thanks, thanks. a lot. Thank you. Bye.